a special thank you and a warm welcome to our Sabbath service as we worship together as Santon Church family. I would like to trust that the Lord has been good to you the past week and by His grace and mercy we are gathered here today to worship and praise Him on this holy convocation that is His Sabbath day. Before we begin, shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Our kind and gracious Father, our Jehovah Lord and God, we are thankful for your mercies and grace and your goodness that meets our needs and carries us through day in, day out. You have brought us yet to another Sabbath and we want to give our praise and thanksgiving to you. We know we are gathered here, Lord. Many may have burdens and many may have seen troubles this week, but we are thankful that we are here. And our prayer and our plea is that you may help us to rest from our burdens, our joys and our peace and bring all our attention to you, to hear your word and to be nourished in spirit and be prepared even for the week to come. Bless us as we go through this Sabbath day and lead us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to welcome you again and thank you for joining us for this Sabbath service. And um, before we go any further, I'll just give you a short rundown of um, the program for the day. We will begin with a Sabbath school program that is prepared for us by the Sabbath school department. After that, we will have a musical interlude presented to us by the music department, followed by the children's stories. This is the order that we will go with with the first half of the service. But before we proceed, let me just uh, remind the church that um, during the course of the week we have had many going through different um, difficulties and troubles and we have had deaths and illnesses and we are still encouraged as a church that we keep each other in prayer and continually so because we all need to intercede on each other's behalf because the times we are living are difficult and alone we may not make it but together as the children of God when we call to him, he has promised to hear us and to answer our prayers. So in that regard, I remind the church that we continue to pray for each other and for the church at large, even for the world as we go through these new and unprecedented times. I will now hand over to the Sabbath School for the Sabbath School program. Thank you. Happy Sabbath everyone and welcome to, do, to today's Sabbath School. Uh, this is Sizwe together with Musonda here and we'll be doing Sabbath School this, uh, this morning. Uh, before we, we go any further, let's open up with a word of prayer. Our kind and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you dear Lord for this Sabbath morning. Uh, we're, as your children, we're here to share your word. We're also here to uh, hear from, from your dear Father in heaven and to learn principles to apply into our lives. We pray that you may be with each and every one uh, as they listen from their respective places, their respective homes, that they may find a blessing in this, uh, in this uh, Sabbath school. We pray that you may be with each and every one of us, dear Lord, and guide us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Uh, over to Musonda, uh, yeah, who will tell us, um, who will introduce today's topic. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today, our Sabbath school is on something we've all either used or seen being used, and this is a GPS. Usually, it's um, for directions, if you don't know a certain neighborhood you're in, for example, or if you're going somewhere and you, you're not too sure of the directions, uh, or you don't know exactly where you're going, then you can use a GPS. Uh, so, um, yeah, a GPS is in essence for directions. But today we're going to be talking about a high-level GPS, which is God's positioning system. And we're going to describe three features of, of this GPS system. And the features are directions, routing, and rerouting. To get started, Caesar will describe the first feature, which is directions for us. So, uh, with the regards to directions, the, one of the primary uses of a GPS is, is 
directions. You need directions to go to, to a specific location, a specific destination that you aren't generally uh, familiar with as to how to get there, uh, which is why you use the GPS uh, and you for, for directions, right? Um, one of the two basic, two main things, as we, as we would all know, the GPS would give you the, the distance that the journey will take and it also give you, gives you the time, so distance, time, and also uh, generally uh, GPSs are, are voice automated, so they, they, you know, there's a lady talking uh, throughout the entire process. Um, where, and everything about a GPS is very specific, because if it weren't, it would be, it would be easy to, 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 to get lost, right? Uh, so it's very specific, it tells you exactly when to turn, how long it will take, and the time it would take. And when we think of God's positioning system, it might not necessarily be as specific as a GPS, right? Especially in our personal lives. But we find that uh, God still has a way of leading us to where we need to be, despite the fact that he's not always specific. Um, we find that in our, in our, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, there are certain things that God might be si seemingly silent on, which He requires us to exercise our faith in Him in order to maneuver through uh, being guided by His Word, which we can think of as, uh, as the map that actually directs us. Uh, however, there are things where He might not uh, be specific, uh, you know, like by saying something loudly to us as a GPS would, but ultimately at the end of the day, he leads us to where we need to be. That's not to say that God is never specific uh, in how he, he guides his people. A good example of that is prophecy. In prophecy, he actually specifies how long certain things will take. He actually specifies when they start, when they end. So there are, there are those situations where he's very specific and there are those situations where he's not as specific but uh, requires us to exercise faith in him by following the directions that he has given us in his manual or the, 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 the Bible, manual of the Bible. So yeah, with regards to directions, those are the two main things. Also the voice automation is also very important that, uh, you know, like a GPS, uh, God, God's positioning system, God himself, uh, there are times where he actually speaks to us uh, audibly. Um, we hear of uh, an example in, in, in the book of Psalms the book of uh, 1 Kings 19 where we hear of God speaking to Elijah in a still small voice uh, but we also hear of God speaking to to Isaiah uh, speaking to Isaiah in Isaiah 30 verse 21 saying and your ear shall hear a word behind you saying this is the way walk in it when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left so you, you find that there are those situations where God actually speaks to us and tells us, uh, do this, do that, uh, don't do this, don't do that, uh, and it's very audible and he, he, he directs us. And then there are those times where, where he's not as specific. So unlike a GPS, God um, is sometimes specific, um, but then there are times where he's not as specific. Uh, and the reason for that is because he, he requires us to exercise faith in him uh, by following uh, the directions that he has already given to us in his word, taking out the principles to apply to our lives. So that's it with regards to directions. The second feature of our GPS is routing. So we know with GPS, usually the GPS will either take you to your shortest route with your shortest ETA, which is your estimated arrival time, and sometimes we'll take you through a longer route, which will, which allows you to arrive at your destination after a shorter period of time. This is because it, it routes you on a road to avoid certain hurdles. Um, God's positioning system is different from this in the sense that the shortest route with God's positioning system isn't always necessarily the best. Um, also, there's a similarity though, because um, sometimes God will reach you through a longer path or it will seem that things are taking long to, to actually come into fruition. And for, for us, this will look like it's a longer path, but um, sometimes this longer route is actually the better one for us or for our situation. We see an example of this in Exodus 
13, Exodus 13, 17 to 18, uh, which reads, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. We see in this story that we all know that God routed the Israelites through a longer path, knowing that the shorter one wouldn't be the best for them. Even though it was shorter, it wasn't necessarily the best route. And this is what we can learn from our, our GPS, God's positioning system. And the last thing is rerouting. So there are those times uh, really when we're driving, right, uh, to, to a specific destination. And somehow, you know, you were following, you were on the right path, you are following, uh, on, you're on the fastest uh, ETA, you're supposed to get there at a certain time, uh, having traveled a certain distance, but then there's that, maybe that crucial last turn, left turn or right turn, whatever it may be, that the GPS tells you about, about and then you end up missing the, the turn that you're, the crucial turn that you're supposed to make, which could, you know, uh, uh, unnecessarily lengthen your journey. There are times like that where in our in our journeys where in our journey with God, you know, uh, he had said, uh, turn here or do this. And somehow due to your own ignorance or perhaps due to your own self-sufficiency thinking, you know better, uh, you end up going uh, in a different direction to the to the one that God had, 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 had specified initially, which then takes you unnecessary which makes your journey unnecessarily longer than it should have been now the problem with that is that uh, on that longer journey you might now experience things that you perhaps would not have experienced had you not gone on that journey for example if there were not no portals in your initial journey you you would now experience them you could possibly now experience them on the new journey because you missed the turn that was that was supposed to take you home or to take you to your destination and so there are times like that where we're in our, in our walk with God, due to our own ignorance, our own mistakes, our own self-sufficiency, we go in a different direction, or perhaps uh, we, we go in a different direction, which then results in us you know, uh, experiencing unnecessary hardship. But as is the case with the GPS, right? It doesn't just go silent when you make the wrong turn. It actually tells you, uh, um, in 300 meters, make a U-turn. Uh, it tells you that, it shows you that you've gone wrong. It reroutes, try, try to find another direction, another, you know, uh, more directions to take you back to that initial place, uh, to take you back to your initial destination. So in the same way as the GPS does not give up, uh, give up on you, uh, in that same way, God doesn't give up on his children when they make mistakes or, or move past the ideal that he had initially set for them. But he, he directs them, he helps them, and tries to bring them back to where he, he, where he initially wanted them to be so that they may reach the destination that God had in mind for them from the very beginning. And so um, an example of that, a very good example of that is with, is with Peter. Um, you know, after Peter denied Jesus, uh, we find that Jesus didn't just keep quiet after that, you know, after his resurrection, but he actually called for Peter and recommissioned him, who put him back on the mission that uh, Christ initially uh, had planned out for him. And then we find Peter, you know, following in that direction uh, and going and going and, and you know, fulfilling his mission. Uh, because though he had missed the turn uh, due to his own self sufficiency of thinking that he knew better than, than Christ. We find that uh, we find that Peter is recommissioned after his uh, his denial of Jesus, and he's brought back to 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 the to the journey to 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 the mission that God had given him. And so uh, that's it with regards to uh, God's positioning system, and that's it uh, from our Sabbath school for today. To summarize our Sabbath school, God is always directing, rooting, and guiding us in our different paths in life. Sometimes we, we may not like it, it might be weird, scary, 
It might not make sense, we might be unhappy about it, but we may rest assured that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Shall we close in prayer? Our kind and loving Father who art in heaven, we'd like to thank you, Lord, for being with us on your blessed Sabbath day. Father, we ask that you are with us throughout the rest of the day and with all the programs that will be taking place today. We ask that you touch our minds and our hearts and that we are able to receive the message that you have prepared for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. It is now time to receive the word of uh, God as children. I always look forward to this segment when the word of God is presented in a simple and easy to understand but effective way. While meant for our children, it is well worth the attention of adults as we get nuggets of the simplicity of the plan of salvation and the love of God. It is time for children's stories. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for our life. Thank you for the, our help. Thank you for being with us all these years. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for sharing all the love that you have and, and you can. And thank you for always being there for us. Showing that we're really human beings and we really care for each other. And in the name of Jesus, pray, Amen. Let's sing a song. Hello, everybody. I am here today at church with some friends of mine. On the bass guitar, I have L. And on the other guitar, the invisible one, I have Chad. Chad. All right. And in front of me, I have Ashanti, Marshe, Nosipo, Lindy, and Mb And we are here today to do a few songs that you can sing along with us uh, and enjoy as we praise the Lord. We're going to start with one song that I know you know. It is a song that says, I have got the joy. And if you look at all the people here, do we not have joy? So you should have joy at home as well. Let's show them the joy we have, all right? Let's show them the joy.
Hello, everyone. It's Anfernita. Today's story is called "Swim, Climb, and Fly." Today's memory verse is from Revelation chapter twenty-two, verse one. It says, "The angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb." Today's message is God has prepared wonderful things for us to enjoy throughout eternity. When you have been outside on a hot day, a big, cool glass of water tastes wonderful. Now read about a river whose clear water gives life to all who drink it. Remember Adam and the great family reunion in heaven. Jesus gave Adam a piece of fruit from the tree of life. That was just one of twelve different kinds that grow on the tree. Unlike trees on Earth, the tree of life gives a different fruit every month. The leaves are useful too. The Bible says the leaves help heal all who have joined Jesus in heaven. This wonderful tree grows on each side of the river of life. The river of life runs right down the middle of a golden street. The river water is as clear as crystal. We can see all the way to the bottom. It flows from the throne of God. We can eat fruit from the tree of life and drink water from the river of life forever. The river will never dry up. The tree will never die. God and Jesus sit on their thrones in heaven. We can talk to them face to face. We can visit them at any time because there is no night. It's story time. No night means there's no darkness. The light from God's glory makes everything bright. We won't need lamps or candles or even the sun, and we will never get tired. We won't have to take naps or even go to bed. Every minute in heaven is like morning. We will spend some of our time learning new things, but not in the same way as on Earth. Our brains will be perfect, so we understand and remember well. Jesus will teach us new things. We will do everything we ever wanted to do: swim in the deepest water. Climb the highest mountains, go to the highest heavens. We can soar to all the planets of the solar system and beyond. We will be able to go to different worlds in seconds and talk to the people who live there. They will tell us everything they have learned about God. They will tell us how they watched everyone and everything that happened on Earth. From the beginning of our creation, when we aren't traveling, we'll be working, but our work will be enjoyable. We won't get sore muscles. We won't get hurt. We will enjoy rose bushes without thorns. We'll walk through places that bloom with beautiful flowers and flow with sparkling streams. We will run through forests without dangerous creatures. Flowers will never die, and leaves will never fall off trees. In heaven, no one will be sad, no one will be sick, no one cries, no one dies. We will never, ever have to be separated from our best friends or our favorite cousins. Every day will be like a family reunion or the first day of school after vacation. And best of all, Jesus will be with us every second. We can ask him all the questions we ever wanted to. We will have all the time in the world to learn more about his love for us, and we will have all the time in the world to praise him, to tell him how much we love him. Wouldn't you like to do that?
thank you to our children's department for such a wonderful children's program. I'm sure our children enjoyed it and we've all been nourished. At this point, I would like to just remind the church that as we now go into the part where we bring our tithes and offering to the Lord in worship to him and in thanksgiving for what he has done for us, I would just like to remind the church that there is a special a special appeal that is being made by the church with regards to the welfare department. Many of us have gone through economic difficulties because of the pandemic that has been upon us and the lockdown and I think the effects are now being felt even more amongst our brethren. The church continues to support those who need and we continue to pray that the Lord will bring sustenance to all of us. But as we pray we are also called to action. We are reminded church that we continue to replenish the stores of the Lord. So a special appeal is being made that we give to the welfare department and when we do our remittances and transfers to the church, may we just use the reference welfare so that the treasury department will know to allocate those resources to the welfare department. We are not only required to do this in monetary terms, if you are able to bring non-perishable uh, food items or even items of clothing, we are encouraged to continue to do so as we assist those of us who are less fortunate. Thank you. At this moment, I will hand over to Sister Unati, who will be doing for us the usual offertory reading. Over to you, Sister Unati. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. Today, I will be presenting the offertory reading, which is entitled When Money is Gone. Mary and Marcus Bamfin, a ministerial couple in Brazil, were facing a terrible economic crash in their home months after their wedding in 1986. Powered by some poor financial choices, in addition to an 80% inflation rate in the country, their financial crisis happened shortly after they decided to raise their promises percentage from 3 to 5% in recognition of God's blessings by providing both with a job. One morning while leaving for work, Mary asked Marcus to buy some groceries at the open fair. He answered, however, that all their money was spent, including their savings with two weeks to go before the next paycheck. After pouring out his heart to God that morning, Marcus found some unexpected money in his pocket, maybe enough to buy only a dozen bananas. But besides the bananas, he came back from the market that day with a dozen oranges and some zucchini also. Later, while feeding their chicken, which they kept in their yard, shared by other ministerial families, a neighbor offered him lettuce and kale from their garden. Climbing the wall back from feeding the chicken, the sound of a falling avocado reminded Marcus that an elderly pastor asked him to pick his avocados and share with him the harvest. And so he did bringing home a bag full of them. Suddenly, he realized that they were witnessing a miracle like those of biblical times. When Mary arrived home, she couldn't believe she was being welcomed by bananas, oranges, zucchini, lettuce, kale, and avocados. Both Marcus and Mary knelt before the produce to thank their provider for such deliverance. Realizing that it would be impossible for them to eat it all, Mary suggested to share some lettuce, kale, and avocado with Marcus's parents. When he arrived at his parents' home, his mother offered him two whole wheat loaves of bread and three liters of milk, all blessings in the same day. Marcus barely could drive back home as tears of awe from God's greatness flooded his eyes. Our appeal today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can trust in his faithful and true promises. Let us worship him with our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Dear God, we are children of your possession. Please accept the offering of our heart and bless us as we approach your holy presence today. Amen. Thank you, Sister Onati, for the offertory reading. It is now time for us to come to the Lord in prayer and in interceding for each other and for the world at large because that is our duty as Christians. We are now going to be led through by our elder, 
Elder Colin Chibafa. He is the one who will be leading us in the pastoral prayer. Over to you, Elder. Growing up as a young boy in the village, I used to love story time, especially the animal trickster tales. These stories helped instill moral values in us as children. The hare was the most prominent trickster. I could never get enough of listening to my grandmother tell us about how the hare would use his quick thinking and mental agility to deceive friends and foe. The Bible, on the other hand, records the reason why its pages are full of the various stories of the patriarchs, prophets, and various believers. These stories are recorded as object lessons, examples from which we should learn. Learn what not to do and learn what to do. It is paramount that we break the old adage that the only thing we learn from history is that we do not learn anything from history. We shall briefly review the experience of Daniel in Babylon and how he fared when his life was placed under immense scrutiny. In Daniel chapter 5, we learn about the events that happened at the end of the Babylonian rule. King Belshazzar was weighed in the scales of heaven and found wanting. And that very night, judgment was passed and King Belshazzar was slain and Darius the Mede took over. Darius set about reorganizing the kingdom. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other presidents and governors, for he had great ability, and the king began to think of placing him over the entire empire as his administrative officer. This made the other presidents and governors very jealous. The vice regents and governors got together to find some old scandal or skeleton in Daniel's life that they could use against him, but they couldn't dig up anything. They could find no evidence of negligence or misconduct. So what do events that happened centuries ago to a Hebrew captain have to do with me? Well, Daniel's life is an object lesson for us. As Christians, we ought to live lives of integrity. If we don't, Paul's words in Romans 2 verse 24, that the non-believers blaspheme the name of God because of us will be fulfilled in us. Like Daniel, we should not be corrupt. Our actions should pass scrutiny when examined here on earth by man or in heaven by God. Ours is to remain true and loyal to our calling as Christians and God will take care of the results. Our word should be our bond and we should be faithful in all things. The world should repeat the word spoken by the king of the Philistines to David in 1 Samuel 29, verse 6 and 9. I've never found a single fault in you. As far as I'm concerned, you're as perfect as an angel of God. As we close, God wants us to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures and to live good, God-fearing lives day after day. And finally, since everything around us is going to melt away, what holy, godly lives we should be living all the time. Thank you. A special thank you to Elder Shibafa for carrying the Church of the Lord in prayer to the Most High God. And we are confident that the Lord, as He promised, that we come to Him in prayer and ask of Him. He will indeed meet our every need. It is now time for the message from on high and the chosen vessel for this Sabbath is Dr. Eric Welsh. Let us surrender our hearts to the Lord that he can make the, the soil fertile upon which his word is about to fall so that as the seed falls upon us it may take root and that we may bear much fruit to feed the world that hungers for the Lord's truth. We will have a special music item before we hear from Dr. Walsh and thereafter it will be time for the main sermon.
Happy Sabbath to the Santon Church in South Africa. Um, a blessing to be able to be with you uh, virtually uh, this Sabbath, um, especially being with you from so far across the world. Um, it is a privilege and an honor uh, to be able to worship with you and to share a message with you. Um, I've spent some time with you guys when I was in South Africa, so it's really a privilege to be able to do this, um, knowing the times and how difficult it is um, you know, for us to meet in person. We're just very glad to be able to meet at all. And uh, so we praise God for you and pray that all things are going well there in South Africa as you deal with the pandemic. Uh, let's get right into God's word. Um, we're going to start in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 4. 2 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 4. And the Bible says here, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. A message this Sabbath is entitled, Mocking the Remnant. Mocking the Remnant. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Once again, Lord, I pray that you make me just a nail on the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to start in the, uh, dealing with one of my favorite Bible characters, and that is the prophet Jeremiah. As an overview uh, Je of Jeremiah's life, uh, it's interesting that Jeremiah, his ministry spanned more than four decades and he was the prophet during five different kings of Judah. When his ministry started, Josiah was king, and there was a great reformation taking place in Judah. But after Josiah's death, which the Bible tells us Jeremiah mourned and lamented heavily, a series of kings came up, none of whom rose to the stature of Josiah, each causing different problems. Um, all related to Josiah, of course. Jeremiah had to warn Judah that God was telling them to unite or to cooperate with the king of Babylon, basically to become vassals and to avoid the full onslaught or the most terrible onslaught that Babylon could give them. But of course, they were very angry with Jeremiah for this. They mocked him and uh, questioned his loyalty to the kingdom. Jeremiah 28 uh, happens just after there was a great meeting between many of the nations that uh, the king of Judah was trying to pull together to, to go against Babylon. Jeremiah was brave enough to stand up and tell them, you can't do this, it won't work. Uh, you cannot go against God. What God is saying is true. And then he even tells uh, Zedekiah himself, the king of Judah, uh, that this will not make any sense. You cannot go against what God is telling me to tell you. Jeremiah stood boldly in their faces, and it starts in Jeremiah chapter 1, where God, when he gives Jeremiah his commission that he is going to, to be a prophet and a preacher, um, because he was also a priest, of course. He came from the lineage of priests. But when he told Jeremiah his, his, what his life work would be, his calling on his life, he said to him, do not be afraid of their faces. And so Jeremiah in boldness would preach the truth. So much so that he made many enemies. In Jeremiah 28 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spoke unto me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. So Jeremiah has been saying, listen, we're going to be in captivity 70 years. Uh, Babylon is going to be risen to um, the, the, the top of the world in terms of power. 
um, and we have no choice but to submit. Hananiah, another one from a priestly lineage, as Gibeon was also like, like Jeremiah's hometown, was also a, a, a city of, for priests. Um, and he says in the temple, in the house of the Lord, in front of all the other priests, Hananiah says, God, the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts, spoke to him and he said, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then he goes on to say, forget Jeremiah's 70 year prophecy. In verse three, he says, within two full years, will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. Then he says in verse 4, And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So he says, first of all, Jeremiah's lying. It's not going to be 70 years. He says, second, Jeremiah's uh, inaccurate because uh, Jeconiah will come back and reign as king. We'll get back to that again in a second. He says, and all of the vessels will be brought back. The vessels are key in the story of the scripture because these are the very same vessels that not only did Nebuchadnezzar take and were argued over here as to be coming back, but all, later on in the book of Daniel, this is where uh, the king of Babylon, Belteshazzar, actually uses these, um, Belshazzar uses these uh, to, um, to, to serve foreign gods. So there's a lot of relevance around this. And Hananiah is saying, everything is going to be brought back. He says again, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah is standing there as this lie, this blatant lie. He, Hananiah had not spoken to God. Verse 5, then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. Huh. The Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Jeremiah, I, I believe here, is using sarcasm. I, I can almost imagine Jeremiah walking up to him and clapping slowly like this. As if to say, well done. But Jeremiah is speaking sarcastically, I believe, because here he says, nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. He says, listen, prophets like Isaiah prophesied the destruction of kingdoms. They spoke of the war that was to come, of pestilence to come, of great evil. They did not speak of smooth, soothing words. Verse 9, the prophet which prophesied of peace. When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then the prophet be known, shall be shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Jeremiah says, listen, you prophesying all of this peace, but the only way we're going to know if you're talking the truth is when we see that peace come to pass. And I want to tell you that we live in a time of prophets of peace. Prophets of peace that are telling you that God is too merciful to destroy the world. Prophets of peace that tell you don't worry about the signs of the times. Everything is happening as it was. Prophets of peace and prosperity that tell you that if you have faith in God, you should be driving a Bentley and living in a mansion. But these are all prophetic lies just as Hananiah's lie was. We live in a time when even in our own denomination, there are many uh, preaching sermons. I heard one pretty pr pr uh, um, well-known Adventist pastor preach a sermon, put down the trumpets. We sing a hymn that says, lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Let it ring. Jesus is coming again. <coughs> but this group says, put down the trumpet. Others are saying, in one sermon that I heard, they said, the end is not yet. That was the title of the sermon from Matthew 24. So there are many who are saying, we ought not be worried about the prophecies. They're prophesying peace, even in our day. But let me tell you something, things are only getting worse. 
A friend of mine was debating this with me when I sent around some of the current events in a text <clears throat> saying that everything is really just happening as it was, just like it says in 2 Peter 3 and, and, and uh, 2, Peter 2, 2 Peter 3 and verse 4, saying, listen, things always happen the same. But it's funny, while, the church, while church folk are saying everything is happening the same as it always has, the world is saying that things are getting worse. It says here, <clears throat> why California, California wildfires are getting worse. There's an article here on that. And then in the article, and I believe this is maybe from Time Magazine, there's a great picture up top here of how these fires are burning in California. And this is what they say. This is what the world is saying. The warming climate has dried out California's landscape, turning it into a tinderbox. It's no coincidence that last year vegetation was at record levels of dryness in the part of California where the most destructive fire in the state's history was burning. <clears throat> One study showed that the burned areas consumed by California's wildfires have increased by more than 400% between 1972 and 2018. <clears throat> we are living in a time when things are getting worse. Fires in California, they said, are, there's people saying it's climate change, but it, it's not just climate change. NBC News, I was watching just today, said uh, one of the national news uh, stations here in the state said that, in fact, it's also because we have not been managing the forests well. So there's a lot of veg dry vegetation to burn. <clears throat> but it's not just America. This was Australia earlier this year. In Australia, nearly 3 billion animals were killed or displaced by Australia's fires. <clears throat> you can see the poor kangaroo here hopping around and the fires in the background. Three billion animals, at least one billion of them killed. Yet stronger storms are coming, not just fires. 40 years of data confirm hurricanes are getting stronger. Climate models were right. According to the data, the likelihood of a hurricane developing into a Category 3 storm or greater with sustained winds of over 177 kilometers an hour or 110 miles has increased by 8% every decade since 1979. Every year, year over year, by decade, things are getting worse. So are earthquakes. People say, well, we've always had earthquakes. But when you look at significant earthquakes, greater than 6.0 Richter scale, going all the way back to 1900, this, this cuts it off a little bit here, you can see that destructive and, and deadly earthquakes have increased significantly. <clears throat> even just since 1980, uh, this is since the 1980s here, you can see there's a trend of magnitude six plus earthquakes have gone up over the 10 years. But it's not just the earth or the storms. It's also mass shooting incidents and fatalities. We have watched in America more and more cases of senseless murder. Now, yeah, there's always been murder, there's always been killing, there's always been war, but the mass shootings in America are very different. There's no point, no purpose, nothing to really gain. <clears throat> Yet we've watched as the number of people victimized and shot in these situations continues to increase in America. And even we've had some of these cases happen around the world. So people are saying, listen, it's peace, peace. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about the signs at a time. Nothing's getting worse. But actually, objectively, the world is telling us that, in fact, things are getting worse. While we're being mocked for, for checking the signs of the time and knowing their significance, people are noticing that are not Christians that the world is getting worse. In fact, one of the telltale, telltale signs of the end, based on uh, prophecies of Revelation, is that millennials, this, this article here from, um, uh, I forget which, which, which magazine the article on top is from, but it's why millennials are ditching religion for witchcraft and astrology, just as prophesied. 
The Bible says, in the last days, they'll be given over to doctrines of devils. Time Magazine, this is back in 1972, says the occult revival. And within eight years, America has seen, after that, America has seen an uptick. The, the fastest growing religion, last time I read, fastest growing religion in America now is Wicca and witchcraft. So things are changing. If you're looking at the signs of the times, they're all around you. Look at this, even sexually transmitted de diseases. There's a fall in morality, just as the Bible predicts. Men would be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And here you can see that actually happening. STD cases since 1984 have risen. Look at the, look at the graph. Something is changing. The world is getting worse <clears throat> even if people don't want to recognize that this is a sign of the end. And of course, now people are more bold than ever mocking Christianity. The picture on the left there is, um, was, 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 was um, vehemently protested by Christians in, uh, in Israel when this was put up in one of the museums, I believe in Haifa, where they put Ronald McDonald on the cross. The other one here is a documentary by Bill Maher. I talk about all the time. A brilliant guy, I think. Um, probably a pretty funny guy. He's a comedian. But he has a mission to try and move people out of Christianity specifically, but all religions, into atheism. And this is his documentary to try and do that. It's called Religious. In other words, religion and ridiculous. As if if you are religious, it, you it, to, be, to be a religious person is a ridiculous and foolish thing. And with all of that, People don't want to believe that Jesus is coming soon. I don't put this here to say that I, I'm, I'm, I'm promoting this one week theory here, but I, I, I will say that when you look at over the time, when we say we're at the end of time, when you look at how much time has already passed, even if we were to exist another hundred years, it really is not much time at all. Second Peter 3 and verse 8 says that one day is as a thousand years with God, and there's a thousand year rest coming during the millennium. And we, have, we know the earth has been in existence for 6,000 years, or man has been uh, walking the earth. There is not much time left. When Jeremiah rebukes Hananiah, Hananiah walks over to Jeremiah, and the Bible says he took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck. When Jeremiah told all of them, that Babylon was going to put a neck, a, a yoke on them. He put a wooden yoke around his neck and walked around with it to show them that the king of Babylon would eventually control them. <clears throat> Hananiah goes and he grabs this thing that Jeremiah put on his neck. He violently shakes him, I'm sure, grabs it off of him and breaks it. Second Chronicles 36, 14 says it like this. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had allowed in Jerusalem. The Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. <clears throat> Hananiah breaks the yoke off of Jeremiah in protest to attack Jeremiah but the Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles 36 that, in fact, God, uh, God sent the prophets out of mercy. It was to save his people. Look at 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 16. It says, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. I want to submit to you all that this is where we are now. God has sent warning after warning after warning, and the people have mocked the God of heaven. The Bible tells us here that, in fact, you get to a point where there is no remedy, <clears throat> where there is no way for God to, 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 where God is no longer going to step in because he has been so well rejected. They're going to mock us in the last days. The Spirit of Prophecy says it like um, uh, says it as well. We'll get to that in a second. Mocking the remnant, Noah and Lot were both ridiculed for trying to warn others. Noah, the spirit of prophecy tells us, was mocked as he as he preached for 120 years, telling them that it was a flood was going to come. Lot, of course, was mocked. Look at Genesis 19:14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, 
which married his daughters and said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And 2 Peter 3 says it like this. Verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they were willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. He says, listen, Peter saying, listen, yeah, the last days they're going to mock, they're just like they did at the time of Noah. They're going to scoff at us because they want to be able to do what they've been doing. They want to continue in their sin. Christ in his sanctuary, page 189. When the work of the investigative judgment closes, the destiny of all who have been decided will have all for, of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. Christ in the revelation, looking forward to that time, declares, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he, he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22, 11 and 12. From the book Christ in the Sanctuary, page 189. The righteous and the wicked will still be living upon the earth in their mortal state. Men will be planting and building, eating and drinking, all unconscious that the final irre irre irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. Before the flood, after Noah entered the ark, God shut him in and shut the ungodly out. But for seven days, the people, knowing not their doom was fixed, continued their careless, pleasure-loving life and mocked the warnings of impending judgment. So says the Savior, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, Matthew 24, 39, silently unnoticed as the midnight thief, will come the decisive hour which marks the fixing of every man's destiny, the final withdrawal of mercy, Mercies offer to guilty men. Just like there would be this time before the flood hit for seven days when Noah was locked in and they were all locked out, they continued to mock him during that time. So will it be now when Jesus stands up in the sanctuary in heaven and says it is done. Men on earth will continue in their revelry in their mocking of God, they will continue as if nothing will ever change, not knowing that their fate has been sealed, probation has closed. Donna White says this in Testimony Treasures, volume two, page 75, the deadly lethargy of the world is paralyzing your senses. Sin no longer appears repulsive because you are blinded by Satan. The judgments of God are soon to be poured out upon earth. Escape for thy life. Genesis nineteen seventeen. Escape for thy life is the warning from the angels of God. The same warning given to Lot and his family. But the mockers, there are other voices. The Spirit of Prophecy says this. Other voices are heard saying, do not become excited. There's no cause for special alarm. <clears throat> Those who are at ease in Zion cry peace and safety, while heaven declares that swift destruction is about to come upon the transgressor. The young, the frivolous, the pleasure-loving consider these warnings as idle tales and turn from them with a jest. Do not become excited. There's no cause for special alarm. They are going to mock 
even then. But Jeremiah 28 and verse 11 says this, And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. <clears throat> and the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So Hananiah takes this yoke that Jeremiah symbolically was wearing to represent what Nebuchadnezzar was going to do to Judah and the other nations. He takes it and he breaks it. <clears throat> Hananiah then turns, I can imagine, to the adoring crowd and says, God has said that this is what he's going to do to Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to break him off the neck of all the nations. Jeremiah doesn't argue with him. And we don't know how long it is before Jeremiah talks to God. But Hananiah continues in his lies. Here's what Jeremiah, how it happens to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 28, 12. <clears throat> then, the Lord, then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, the prophet. After that, Hananiah, the prophet, had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. God says, listen, because of you, Hananiah, and your lying prophecies, God says, the yoke would have been like a yoke of wood, but because of you, Hananiah, the yoke will be more like a yoke of iron. Verse 14, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And they shall serve him. And I gave him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore said the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. And look at verse 17. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Jeremiah goes back, <clears throat> finds Hananiah, tells him, nope, God has said, in fact, instead of a wooden, um, a wooden yoke, it's going to be of iron. All the nations are going to be are going to be locked in just as God had said. He says, and because you are lying in your prophecies, <clears throat> You're, you're, in, you're um, uh, trying to get people to rebel against me. He says, this very year, Hananiah, you're going to die. And sure enough, Hananiah dies in the same year in the seventh month. Now, you would think that after that, people would listen to Jeremiah. Hananiah prophesied that within two years, Nebuchadnezzar would go away. Jeremiah says, this year, you're going to die. And he dies. You'd think that that would have been enough. I, it would have been enough for me. I'd have said, wait a minute. This Jeremiah is really the prophet here. He's the one that he predicted the other prophet's death and he died. But that's not what happened. Jeremiah 6.14 says, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Other translations put this like this. It says that they have, they have looked at the wound, like a festering wound on my daughter, and they have basically looked over it as if to say the wound is going to heal. They have said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You see, people are looking at a world uh, struck with sin and problems, and, and people want to say, don't worry, everything is fine. There are many who only want to preach the side of God that says that God is love and God is mercy, but they don't want to preach the side where God says, I will not tolerate rebellion against me. I will not uh, strive with those who strive against me. They do not want to deal with the judgment side of God. Let me tell you something. Without judgment and justice, there can be no mercy. Jeremiah 8.20 says the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. In fact, when you look at the story of the king of Judah and, the, and I should say the nation of Judah, all the opportunities from all the different prophets for them to get their lives right. The example of Hezekiah and Josiah for them to get right with God. Instead, they continued to rebel against him. There was a harvest time when they when the seed was planted by the prophets of God and they ignored the prophets. They mocked 
the remnant. The Bible says the harvest is past, the summer has ended. And we are not saved. To show you how this all works out for them, there are here are the five kings that were alive during the time of Jeremiah. Josiah, of course, was killed at Megiddo because he disobeyed and went to fight against the Egyptians when he should have left them alone. Nico, who kills him, ultimately takes um, his son Jehoahaz into captivity, allowing Jehoiakim to come into office. Um, uh, Jehoahaz was only in for three months before Jehoiakim took over. He rebelled against Babylon and he was killed. Then Jehoiachin comes along, we were just mentioned in the verses, and he was exiled to Babylon. This is who Hananiah was saying was going to come back, but of course, that wasn't going to happen. Zedekiah, for not listening to the prophet Jeremiah. When Zedekiah, who was uh, Jehoahaz's uh, and Jehoiachin's, he was actually um, 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 uh, uh, the son of Josiah as well. But when he uh, came to power and, and had to face Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar kills his sons in front of him and then plucks his eyes out so that the last thing he would ever remember <clears throat> is seeing his sons killed in front of him. And Zedekiah is the last king of Judah. Three attacks on, on, on Judah and on Jerusalem. But the last one, the one that Jeremiah tried to warn him about, is the one that nobody listened to. And it is like that today. A last great visit by God is going to happen. The second coming is about to happen. And just as in the last uh, attack on Jerusalem, nothing was left standing, the temple was destroyed, the king's palaces were destroyed, all of the wealthy and, 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 and all of the nobility were all taken into captivity. Only the poor were left behind. And, just, and, and even though people are mocking us now as the remnant, mocking our doctrine and our beliefs in what is happening in the world right now, 2 Peter 3 says the same thing will happen in the end times. 2 Peter 3, 7 says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand uh, years as one day. Peter says, listen, the world is reserved for judgment. The spirit of prophecy says that just as God reached into the bowels of earth to pull out the water for the flood, he will reach into the bowels of earth to pull out fire for the final destruction of earth. God, time doesn't matter. Verse 2 Peter, Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why? As God is being mocked for not returning, why does God ultimately continue to delay? There, there are a few reasons, but I want to focus on this one. It is actually God's mercy. He's made a promise. A promise like in John 3, 16. That whosoever believes in his son would be saved. He's made a promise that he would reach out to those who are suffering, that the doors of eternity would be opened. As Jesus gives us an example in the story of the prodigal, God has made a promise. He's long-suffering to us. He is allowing time to continue because he doesn't want anyone to perish. But that all should come to repentance. What men mock is actually God's mercy. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing all then that all these things shall be dissolved, 2 Peter 3, 11, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. And the element shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth. Church, let me tell you something. I know how tough the times are. And yeah, seems like God is holding up 
for those of us who want to go home with him. He says he's not slack concerning his promises. He will do what he said he will do. And we, according to his promise, because he has promised it, we look for a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no more raging fires, no more hurricanes, no more mass shootings, no more death or pestilence, no more coronaviruses. We look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Peter finishes it off by saying this, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Yes, they're going to mock the remnant. I've been mocked. I've been ridiculed. Some will call you fanatic for believing that Jesus is soon to return and that the signs are being fulfilled. But let me tell you, God is coming for a people without a spot or a blemish. The trials that we're going through now, as I've said in many of the other sermons in these series, the trials that we're going through now are trials to purify us. Because God is coming for a people without spot or blemish. Here Peter says, without spot and blameless. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, Peter says in 2 Peter 3.15. Jesus is waiting. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on me to get our acts together. To invite in the Holy Spirit and to have our characters transformed to be more like his. Yes, the world is going to mock you. But let me tell you something. Satan means the accuser. He mocks. He will continue to mock Hold fast to God's promises. It's interesting because one of my friends was texting me these mocking things. And as I began to study for this message based on his texts, I realized that even the mocking of the signs of the times or of those who are willing to preach present truth and end time prophecy is in itself a sign that Christ is soon to return. Santa, let me tell you, I want you to be ready when Jesus comes. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I pray that many would be awoken to the fact that we do not have much time left here on earth. You tell us in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan is busy because he knows he has a short time. Yet we are mocked when we preach that there's only a short time. Father God, help us to stay steadfast like Jeremiah, not not afraid of their faces, but that we would stand and boldly preach this truth and allow your Holy Spirit to do the work of cleansing and trials, Lord, to do the work of purifying. And one day, Lord, we will be able to look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. Lord, save us all into your kingdom, we pray. Amen. We have now come to the end of our Sabbath worship service. I am confident that you have been blessed just as much as I am by the program. I would like to thank all those who served in this service, as well as the teams that have been working behind the scenes, who organized and coordinated that this program becomes the success that it is. May the Lord continue to richly bless each and every one of you in every aspect of your lives as you continue to serve in his vineyard. Lastly but not least, I would like to thank all who joined in this worship service. Until we meet again next week, may the Lord continue to bless you. Let us pray. Gracious and kind Father, we are thankful for the blessings that you continue to give us, for the service that we had and every educational program, every reminder we got and every word that you gave us today. May you continue to help us to be nourished in spirit and to grow and that that which we have learned today may be seen in our lives and that the world may benefit from it. May your light shine ever so much upon us as well as the world as we carry your word across. May you be worshipped and praised in our lives and continue to be with us throughout this day and the week ahead. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.